Good morning, uh, folks. My name's Robert Coulter. I'm the General Manager for Partnerships here at the AFA. My, my uh, pleasure to be introducing uh, this morning's webinar. So we last heard from Brian Parker, the Chief Economist for Sun Super, in May, uh, which seems some time ago as we continue to manage through this COVID-19 pandemic. And today, Brian provides us an update on the COVID-19 and its consequences as we ask the question, is the beginning of the end, is this the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? So many of you will be familiar with Brian. Prior to joining uh, Sun Super, Brian worked in a series of economics, asset allocation and communication roles with a range of firms, including Rothschilds, JP Morgan, Citigroup, MLC and the Reserve Bank uh, of Australia in a career spanning uh, over 25 years. Um, Brian, as you all know, is a regular uh, guest on the ABC News Channel. In addition to his investment day job, he presents on economic and investment matters to a wide range of audiences across Australia and over the years has addressed audiences across Asia, New Zealand, um, France, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Dubai and UK. So Brian, before I hand over to you, I'd just like to cover off some webinar uh, housekeeping today. As you know, um, this has one CPD hour available. We will send that out to you um, within the next week. Um, Brian is very happy to ask, uh, uh, answer any questions at the end of this presentation. So if you use the Zoom uh, question uh, and answer feature, don't use the chat feature, but the Q&A &Q feature, you can see in the diagram on the slide, uh, we'll then, um, we'll revert to that at the end. This is also being recorded as well. So you'll be able to access the recording on the AFA um, site. Um, Brian, I've been looking forward uh, to today's presentation. We had great feedback uh, back in May. Uh, I know there has been plenty uh, going on. Um, I trust that you, the audience, will find today's webinar of value. And of course, we welcome any uh, feedback that you have. Brian, thanks for putting this together um, to help our members. Um, uh, lots and lots of people have registered for today. so. Um, uh, congratulations and over to you. Thanks Robert and thanks very much uh, to the AFA again for the invitation to come back and speak. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to start off by really recapping uh, what we spoke about last time um, and, uh, and doing something which I thought was a bit either brave or foolhardy and actually revisiting what I said last time to see actually whether any of it made sense with subsequent months. Um, before we begin, of course, this is just general advice, doesn't take into account anyone's circumstances, doesn't take into account any of our client's circumstances. Um, you can get a hold of our PDS from our website or you can get our, uh, mem any of our members can call us on 13 11 84. Um, now, the main messages in May 2020, um, if we think about the, the global economy, um, one thing which was really, really clear was that we were going to be in the midst, and really back then we were in the midst um, of the worst global downturn in any of our lifetimes. Um, we did note that the monetary and fiscal response um, was particularly aggressive. If anything, um, the policymakers had really pleasantly surprised by stepping up quickly and in size. Uh, but we also suggested that there was more to do, especially uh, from governments. Um, similar message here in Australia. We thought that, uh, again, we were going to be in the midst of a very, very deep recovery. Uh, sorry, a very deep recession uh, with a large spike in unemployment. Uh, we also thought that as globally, um, the government would have more to do. Uh, and we, I did express some concern that uh, the amount of money um, may not prove to be enough and that um, uh, money may need to be added uh, and also that money might not flow quickly enough. Um, in terms of markets, um, really made the point then that every crisis throws up opportunities and that this one was likely to be no different. Um, also noted that given the sharp fall we saw in share markets during March, that shares had become even more attractive compared to cash and, and fixed income. Um, and that uh, that was the an early opportunity, if you like, if you were brave enough to step up and uh, add to your equity holdings during March, uh, that proved to be a w fairly wise decision. Um, we also thought there'd be opportunities over time uh, in the alternative, alternative asset classes, in unlisted asset classes, in carefully selected hedge funds and private credit type strategies. Also noted that back then, um, 
all super funds were in the midst of this balancing act. Um, not just the desire to actually um, capture opportunities, so keeping dry powder available for those opportunities, uh, but also making sure that we met our members' demands for liquidity. Um, and that was really a twofold demand. Firstly, um, a relatively small number of members moving a relatively sizable amount of money uh, from balanced and growth options into cash and capital guaranteed options. Um, and secondly, the early release scheme from super. Um, we didn't believe the government's early figure that there would only be about 27, 28 billion and change. We thought it would be about double that. Uh, and that has proven to be the case. Um, so that balancing act um, was a challenge, but it's an act that it's a balancing act that super funds um, have uh, by and large met and met fairly comfortably. Um, this is not our first rodeo. Uh, we stress test for these kind of events. We stress test for major liquidity drawdowns. Um, and thankfully, um, the liquidity demands from our members have been well within the kind of uh, limits that we previously stress tested for. That was what we thought then. Well, what subsequently happened? Uh, well, if I look at the key indicators of business conditions uh, that get published in the most timely way, so this is the purchasing managers indices of business conditions. And um, I might have showed this chart last time. So this just shows you the sort of global summary on the left. Um, and uh, by, by industry breakdown on the right. Um, and no matter how you slice it, uh, we certainly saw a very, very sharp downturn in activity, far sharper than even the GFC, but we have also seen a rebound. Now, the way these uh, figures are calculated, 50 is meant to be neutral. In other words, the economy is neither expanding nor contracting. Above 50, you're in expansion mode. Uh, so what it's telling us is that at a headline level, uh, economies are starting to expand, um, but make no mistake, they are expanding off a sharply lower base. That we've seen a very, very large, um, you know, high single digit, in some cases, double digit decline in GDP uh, during the March and particularly in the June quarters in a number of economies around the place. So we are seeing a recovery, but we're seeing a recovery off a low base. Now here in Australia, um, we'll get, uh, I, I'm always fraud doing these things a day or two before national accounts, uh, but with that proviso, one of the things that is pretty clear that we've seen a similar picture here. We've seen uh, a very, very sharp retracement in spending um, during the June quarter in particular. Uh, we also had the impacts, um, the very, very, very early impacts of uh, COVID-19, but also the bushfire impacts on GDP during the March quarter, uh, which resulted in a negative uh, negative result there. Um, the result for June is likely to be even more negative, um, more likely to call it down 5% for the quarter. Um, the chart on the left shows you uh, retail sales, or at least the quarterly change in retail sales volumes. Uh, and the black line there is the Westpac uh, Consumer Confidence Index. Um, notice that uh, the very sharp fall in retail trade uh, during the June quarter, um, the last time we had a fall that sharp was back uh, following the introduction of the GST. Um, that wasn't really a genuine fall because that was just people bringing forward purchases to get ahead of the GST's introduction. And so there was a payback the quarter after. But realistically, if you, if you allow for that, um, this is just a very, very, this is really the sharpest fall in retail activity that we've seen again in any of our lifetimes. Have seen a bit of a pickup since, uh, at least the July numbers are looking a little better. Um, and uh, we'll get an update on that this week. Uh, but a lot of that progress uh, was very much before the renewed lockdown in Victoria. Other interesting dynamic in the Australian economy, look at the chart on the right. Uh, this just shows you the balance on goods and services. Um, the size of Australia's trade surplus is really quite staggering. Um, and a big part of this is resources. Um, what's really interesting is despite the challenges we've had in the Australia-China relationship, especially in a trade sense, uh, China has uh, certainly been targeting industries like beef and barley and more recently wine, um, but their strategic interest in securing the supply of iron ore is paramount. And that's certainly showing up um, in the fact that our iron ore exports, uh, both in volume terms, but also in value terms, given where prices are, continue to be a very, very strong support to the external side of our economy. Um, we also may have mentioned last time when we asked the question, what does recovery actually look like? Um, and I made the point, I think, that recovery is going to be highly variable, that when the recovery happens, it's going to be very uneven, 
very gradual and it's going to be determined by a whole range of different factors which will vary between countries. So um, this is just a list of some of the factors which go into determining how successful a country is going to be in the recovery phase. One is obviously the macro policy response. Um, is the size of your fiscal policy response in particular, is that been large enough and sustained enough to support the economy during uh, and into the recovery phase? Um, how deep was your decline to begin with? Uh, you know, maybe the bigger you fall, the harder you bounce. Um, how successful you've been at infection control? Um, will also be a key factor, uh, not just controlling the first wave, but limiting or preventing a second wave. Um, your trade linkages, you know, how, how exposed are you to some of the worst affected economies? How flexible is your labour market? In other words, just as you, you managed to lay off labour very quickly uh, during this crisis, how quickly can you bring people back to work? And the financial stability, uh, the reason financial stability is a key factor. We wanted our banks in this crisis to step up and support their customers, uh, you know, providing extended credit, providing loan holidays and things like that to support people through this. You can't do that if your banking system is screwed. Uh, you need a strong financial system and a strong banking system to actually do that. Um, thankfully, Australia has ranked fairly highly on that matter, on that score. Let's talk about some of these factors. Um, now, um, these particular, these charts are really ugly, but bear with me. But one of the things that um, we've been tracking quite closely, a lot of people have been tracking quite closely, is uh, some of these higher frequency data from Google and from Apple in this case about mobility trends. It's quite frightening what Apple and Google actually know about us, but that's another matter. Um, this just shows you how many times, it's basically the number of times that someone picks up their Apple iPhone and, uh, and tries to find directions, either by walking or through public transport or through driving. Um, and Basically, they started publishing this data from the middle of January. So this just shows you uh, using 13th of January as a base, how far the number of uh, requests for directions actually fell. In other words, just how, you know, how much were people just not moving around? And you can see that really, really sharp fall. And you can also see the recovery. But notice that the recovery has started to become a bit divergent that you've seen um, you know, Australia start to taper off a bit again. Uh, you've seen the Italians actually um, race ahead and then pull back a little bit. Um, the Americans also, after a steady recovery, have started to stabilise a bit. You're seeing a lot more divergence, a lot more dispersion uh, in the performance of you know, not just these mobility trends, but also what it says about economic performance, that some regions, some economies are gonna be doing better than others. And that's starting to show up in this very high frequency data. Um, another way of thinking about it is um, Apple also published the same stats by city. So what I've done here is look at the performance of, I think it's about two or 300 cities around the world and looked at how, many, how people are moving around in these cities and it varies dramatically across cities. Um, so this is the standard, standard deviation or the measure of dispersion in activity levels across different cities. And what it shows you is that early in the crisis, there wasn't a lot of dispersion. We were all kind of in the same boat. We we're all in varying degrees of lockdown. But the fact that all these lines have increased is telling you that there's a lot more variability in mobility, in activity across different cities of the world. And this just goes to my point that the recovery was always going to be uneven and that's exactly how it is panning out. Um, again, just go back to some of the macro indicators. So this is Australia and you've seen the impact of the renewed lockdown in Victoria, uh, both in terms of its impact on business confidence. So it's a little hard to see in this chart, but bear with me. But um, the NAB survey on the left just shows you business conditions and business confidence. And after a, sh a sharp spike back up, it's, it did actually pull back a little bit as people went, well, we've, we now have a problem. Similar story with the weekly data from ANZ, Roy Morgan, consumer confidence. Again, sharp recovery, but weakness in more recent weeks, particularly driven by the lockdown in Victoria. Now, uh, the other thing I just wanted to talk a little bit about was when in terms of what the recovery will look like is um, I fear that we will go back to worrying about the same kind of things that we worried about pre-COVID. And if you can remember back as far as late last year or, early, or into January, one of the things that occupied the minds of policymakers was the idea that we were not getting decent wages growth. 
that even though um, at a headline level we were generating jobs, we didn't have enough strength in our labour market to really drive decent wages growth. Now, so what? Well, the so what is it acts as a drag on consumer spending and it also means the Reserve Bank doesn't come within cooey of hitting its inflation target in any meaningful sense. Um, this has just made that issue a lot worse. So the ch this chart here, if I look at the amber line, this is just shows you the rate of labour force under utilisation. Those of you who have seen me present before will know I've used this chart before or a variation of it. So the fact that this amber line has spiked up basically tells you that the, the rate of unemployment plus the rate of underemployment uh, has spiked up to about 19%. Um, and this does correlate quite nicely with the rate of growth in wages. So the blue line here is the annual rate of growth in private sector wages. And just to make it extra confusing, because as you know, what I do, the blue line's upside down so that it actually looks prettier on the chart, but it does confuse people. So the fact that that blue line at the end has actually increased means that wages are slowing down again. And that amber line is telling us where we're heading. Wages, I, I'd be very surprised if we get anything like decent wages growth for at least the next two to three years and arguably longer. Uh, this is not a pretty picture for recovery. It does highlight the challenge that governments are going to have to continue to support household income and spending for some time to come. Um, not just households, but look at the business side of things. The ABS published a survey a little while ago, which I thought was really powerful, where they, and they've done a great job, by the way, uh, in the, the Australian Bureau of, Stats, Bureau of Stats has done a great job in this crisis about publishing really timely indicators of what the, what the economy's doing during COVID. And I thought this survey was really powerful. It just tried to look at the, the overall financial health of businesses uh, and said, and one of the questions they asked them was, look, if things shut down and you had to survive on your cash reserves, how much cash have you got on hand and how long could you last? And it, it breaks it down by industry. The amber bar in the middle is shows you the total and it basically tells you that about 50% of businesses out there said, I've got less than six months worth of cash. Um, that's not a really pretty picture. And uh, at the top there, retail. 60% of retailers said, I've got six months or less. Um, that's I think a fairly frightening stat. Um, what it again tells you is that we went into this crisis with a situation where a lot of businesses were not exactly in terrific financial shape. Um, what it also tells you, sadly, is that a number of businesses simply will not survive uh, this crisis. And to be very, very frank with you, and, and this is, this is, I know this is, this is a somewhat heartless thing to say. You could argue that some of these businesses, frankly, shouldn't survive because they don't they don't have the underlying strength or resilience to survive long term, and they cannot stay on financial life support either from the bank or from the government forever. Uh, let me let me turn to some investment themes um, uh, right now. So, on the economy, bottom line, very very deep recession, gradual uneven recovery, driven by which will vary based on a whole bunch of factors, including things that's like success and infection control. Classic example is what we're seeing in Victoria. The fact that infection rates in Victoria are coming way down again is a great sign. It means that we can start to open up the economy as we get into October, November, which means the December quarter figures for GDP in Australia will end up looking a lot better, which is a good thing. Let's talk about some investment issues. I wanna talk about share markets. I wanna talk about the rise of growth versus value. Um, that we've now gone through this extended period of time where growth stocks and growth managers have significantly outperformed value. Um, related to that, I want to talk about the rise and rise of US big tech. We want to talk about fixed income, both government bonds and, and credit markets. And I just want to touch on some, you know, COVID free investment, COVID resistant investments, if you like. Um, where, where can you hide? Where are some assets could potentially benefit from what's going on out there? Um, more about that. Firstly, the chart. US on the left, Australia on the right. Um, the performance of the growth shares that make up the uh, key market index versus the value shares that make up the key market index. Okay. Um, the fact that these lines have all spiked up is telling you that growth is massively outperformed value. And look at the extreme we are at. 
this tells you nothing about timing. It doesn't tell you anything about, it certainly doesn't say that growth stocks are going to collapse in the next six months and value is going to surge. Um, but it does beg the question, how long can this trend persist, given that we have reached some kind of an extreme? The second thing I would just highlight, um, by the way, if you wanted to run a share portfolio, uh, a global share portfolio in the last year in particular, what did you need to do? What, was, what did success look like? Firstly, uh, you were overweight the US. Uh, second, sorry, firstly, you were overweight growth versus value. Secondly, you were overweight the US versus everywhere. And thirdly, you were overweight tech. Look at the performance of tech. So this is you know, what used to be known as the fangs um, until Google changed its name not very sporting of them. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Alphabet, the artist formerly known as Google, plus Microsoft. Okay, so these six names, um, how big and how dominant have they gotten to? Uh, and this just show puts the, their market value into some perspective, I think. So uh, look, at, look at it from the world perspective on the left. So what I've done here, uh, again, so that I'm not accused of gilding the lily, um, I'm using deliberately some of the broadest market indices I can find to give you an idea of how dominant these companies have become. So for the world, the MSCI World IMI, which is Investable Markets Index, it includes small and mid cap. So this is 5,900 companies in the developed world, okay? Um, back in 2014, these companies, these six names were worth 4% of the world. Today, they're worth nearly 14% of the world, those six companies. That's a fairly, fairly chunky share. It's more pronounced when you look at it in, from the US perspective. So again, this is the US market and I've chosen the US Investable Markets Index. So this is 2,370 companies. Back in 2014, they were 7% of this index. Today, they're a fifth of the index, over a fifth of the index, six names. Um, what it tells you is that uh, a passive portfolio benchmark to this index is a very concentrated portfolio right now. And that's quite remarkable given the size of the US equity market. Now, by the way, I'm not saying that these are dangerously, that these are bad companies or they're not quality businesses. They're very well run, very successful businesses. Uh, and unlike 1999, 2000, these companies, uh, at least some of them make money. Um, they even make good money. Um, my point is that are they big enough and strong enough and profitable enough to justify their current market valuations? I suspect the answer is no, but that tells you nothing about timing. Um, to put it, give you another little frightening stat, if I compared these six companies to the emerging markets, um, again, the investable markets index, small and mid cap and large cap names in the emerging markets, these companies, uh, are equivalent to 96% of the value of the emerging markets, including China, India, et cetera. Those six names are nearly as big as all the emerging markets. Uh, again, I think that's a frightening stat. Let's talk about fixed income. Um, fixed income markets uh, during the worst of the COVID uh, market crisis, so in March, you saw a very sharp widening in credit spreads. So this is uh, investment grade global um, corporate bond spreads on the left. Um, big spike, but it's since recovered. So you've seen credit markets recover very sharply um, post uh, the worst of that financial crisis. Um, now uh, spreads are back to where they were pre-COVID in the investment grade universe. In high yield, so in the junk bond universe, I've shown the US here, but the figures are very similar for Europe. Um, again, big blowout in high yield spreads. Uh, not as bad as the GFC, but very, very sharp. It has come way, way back, but it's now come back to more like an average post GFC. It hasn't sort of come back as far as uh, investment grade. And that's probably sensible, given that um, there's going to be ongoing credit issues, which will continue to roll out as the recovery progresses, even after the recovery continues. Um, so spreads have come back dramatically. Was there an opportunity there to add to your credit exposure? Yes, there was, absolutely. But you needed to move quickly. But here's the problem. Um, sovereign bonds. We already didn't like sovereign bonds going into this because yields were crazily low. Now they're even nutsier, even crazier. Um, that, you know, 10-year German government bonds, you know, negative 30 basis points or so. 
Japan at about zero. Uh, yields in the UK close to zero. Um, means an index portfolio, an index portfolio of sovereign bonds is not only very long duration and therefore very vulnerable to even a small rise in yields, but the income return you're getting is awful. Um, you, can, you can add to that by taking a bit of credit risk, but again, you can't solve the fundamental problem. The risk-free rate is so low that future returns from these defensive assets is going to be terrible. And it's terrible, not by accident, by design, because the world's major central banks have engineered it that way. Um, where do we, what do we do? Firstly, um, we cannot conjure yield out of thin air. Um, the yields are what they are. Um, we had a question, for example, from a member this morning saying, I'm hearing that the yield on the rate on cash could go negative. Um, effectively saying, oh, surely you, Sun Super should guarantee that it won't go negative. I don't control the cash rate. Uh, Sun Super doesn't control the cash rate. None of us do. The cash rate is what it is. Um, I don't think cash goes negative in Australia, but the, rate, the rates are going to stay ridiculously low for an extended period of time. Equities still look to be the best game in town. Um, which is why I would caution against to get against becoming too negative on equity markets right now, because the return available on the alternatives is so low that equities for many asset allocators out there is going to remain the only game in town. That equities still look very, very attractive compared to cash and fixed income. In the alternative space, are we still finding opportunities in the alternative and unlisted space? Yes, we are. And we're finding assets that actually will perform quite well. So for example, um, owning things like data centers as part of your property portfolio. Well, needless to say, data centers have shot the lights out during this particular episode. Owning industrial warehousing has been an absolute godsend at a time when we're all shopping from home and um, you know, warehouse and distribution centers have been highly sought after and have been, again, performing really, really well. So for every shopping center that's really struggling or every airport that may be in trouble and be you know, getting 20, 30, 40% of its normal revenue, there are other assets in a diversified portfolio that are still delivering the kind of income that we need to deliver for our members. Let's just sum up some main messages here. Um, and this is not greatly different to May, to be very honest with you. Um, very deep recession, gradual, uneven, drawn out recovery where success or failure at an economic level depends on a whole range of different factors. There will be some regions that will fare better than others. There'll be some industries that will fare better than others. I have no idea what air travel looks like in 12 months or two years or three years. Uh, we don't know what the typical office looks like in two or three or four or five years. Um, I would caution against giving up on commercial property because one of the things we found is that while working from home um, has advantages and in some cases has been necessary, um, I don't believe it's a long-term solution for everybody. At, a, at the very minimum, how do you maintain some sort of corporate culture uh, when no one has face-to-face -face contact? Uh, I think that's been, that, that is gonna be an ongoing challenge. In addition, um, the idea that you can cram more and more people into smaller and smaller office or, or more crowded office arrangements in a bid to save your rent and encourage flexi desking uh, and hot desking, which in my humble opinion is an abomination, um, which will come to an end if it hasn't already. Um, so there is space that won't be required, but the, people, the fact that offices are going to have to be more spaced out um, Still means we probably don't need as much office space, but I would caution uh, in becoming overly negative on commercial property at this point. Um, sorry, that was a bit of a rant. Globally also, don't forget, Brexit hasn't gone away. US-China tensions have not gone away. If anything, they have gotten worse. But the geopolitical environment, which was a big issue before COVID, has not gone away. This is still a very uh, volatile geopolitical environment. There is, there is no Brexit deal. Um, the risk of Britain tumbling out of the EU without any kind of trade arrangements is not trivial at this point. The US elections 
Um, we have no idea how that is going to pan out. The vagaries of the electoral college, et cetera, et cetera, means that you know, anyone who thinks they know how that election is going to pan out is frankly kidding themselves. I would caution that it, some people are arguing that, oh, if you ended up with a Democrat in the White House and a Democrat majority in both houses, it would be somehow market negative. I don't buy that. Um, if, it's, if it is, it's short term and it's a buying opportunity because over the longer term, there is no evidence really to suggest that a Democrat administration is necessarily terrible for equity markets. Um, if anything, um, you could argue just the opposite in some cases. Um, Australia, again, the Victorian setback has been unfortunate. Our hearts go out to friends and family in Victoria and colleagues in Victoria who are having to suffer through this. Um, there is progress being made, which means that there is light at the end of the tunnel and that is terrific. It has delayed the national recovery and it does mean that September, which was going to be quite a solid quarter, is now likely to be a weaker quarter when it gets reported. June, we know is going to be weak. So that'll confirm that we have a technical recession. Governments have more to do. Um, governments will need to do more to boost growth, uh, whether it's infrastructure or continued support to, to household incomes. Um, it's, it means that the government is going to have to do more to support growth in recovery. I think that's inevitable. Um, crises, in terms of market strategy, as I said last time, crises create opportunities. This one has been no different. One interesting thing though, and again, another reason not to become too negative on markets at this point, there is still an awful large amount of liquidity sloshing around the system, both here in Australia and globally. Couple of key points. Um, we're still seeing lots of demand from global investors uh, looking to acquire assets in infrastructure, et cetera. And not, that's not a Sun Super thing, that's just a global observation. And secondly, even if you look at the Australian share markets, the capital raisings that have gone on, especially the ones that happened earlier, um, a number of good quality companies stepped up to try and raise capital to sort of make sure they could ride out the COVID crisis. They were knocked over in the rush now we were able to participate and we were able to provide liquidity to our share managers uh, so that they could participate without having to sell something else to buy um, new stock um, because they didn't want to sell stuff that after it had fallen in value and they still like the companies, right? So they needed extra liquidity from us to help out. We were able to do that uh, while still ensuring that our members' demands for liquidity were met. That, that was very, very pleasing. But when we put, when we put in bids for stock, to actually participate in the capital raisings, our managers got two tenths of stuff all of what they asked for because demand was so huge. So make no mistake, there is still money out there and money out there in search of a return, especially when that money can't get anything like a decent return from cash or bonds or term deposits. Opportunities will continue to present themselves um, that even if the economy were to turn around tomorrow, um, the fact is damage has been done and that damage will play out and there will be still be distressed opportunities. Um, there will still be people looking for liquidity, still be people looking to raise capital. And as a liquidity and capital provider, there is money to be made. Uh, and we, we, may, we remain well positioned to do that. Uh, that's really about it for me. Um, this is not a happy time for anybody. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We're pretty confident that light is not an oncoming train. Um, but again, it remains a very, very uncertain uh, and very volatile environment. Uh, and with that, um, I'll hand you uh, back to, uh, to Robert. And um, thank you again for the opportunity to present. Um, thank you uh, to all of you out there um, in cyberspace uh, for logging in and uh, happy to take your questions. Thank you, Brian, and, um, and congratulations. I mean, you've taken us through um, quite a bit this morning. We've got a number of questions. Can I just lead off with, a, um, I know you and I had a, a brief chat before this started, but um, I'd love to get your thoughts on the a piece around op opening up the economy and containing the virus. A really big macro thing there, but there's some clearly um, some trade-offs. I know you spoke about Victoria um, during that and lots of talk from our treasurer and our state governments around this. What's your uh, What's your view? Yeah, um, let, let me try and let me let me try and avoid being overly political about this, and then I will consequently fail because I always do. Right? <laughs> um, if you let's go back to when this first started, if you wanted 
to actually do virus containment and not have any economic damage or to at least minimize the economic damage, you needed to be Taiwan, Vietnam and Korea. Okay, which means uh, as soon as you got a whiff of what was happening in China, you quickly thought, you know what, this is not my first rodeo. Um, we're going to have to take some serious steps here. So you slam, on, slam down on it hard. Um, you slam down on cases as, and you contact trace and you um, restrict air travel and you basically um, look ahead and say, look, I've seen this happen before and this is what we need to do and just do it. Um, and that's what they did. And I think that the Taiwanese and the Vietnamese in particular deserve enormous credit for the way they've handled this. And consequently, even though their economies have not escaped damage, the damage has been relatively minimal, okay? Um, it, it, relatively. Let me take the other extreme. You could have done a Sweden. Now, again, the Swedish uh, health policymakers decided, look, um, we, we're just gonna let this go. We'll protect the elderly. So we'll basically isolate the, uh, anyone in aged care um, and we're just going to let it rip because um, we, for most people, it won't be that serious and we'll protect our economy. Uh, and hopefully people will come out of this with immunity. And um, as long as you protect the most vulnerable, um, that you won't have many people die. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The evidence is in. Um, the death rate in Sweden has been one of the highest in the world per capita. And in terms of economic performance, um, their economy is done about as badly as its neighbours that lock down. Okay, so right. you didn't really get much of e economic benefit. Um, the the most visible outcome is is a lot of dead Swedes, um, and that that's and again you can't even we you can't even guarantee you have immunity. Um, we already now have our first documented case in the peer reviewed science of someone who's got this disease again. So this idea that, that herd immunity will save us, the, the let it rip strategy, um, I just don't think the evidence is, is I just don't think the evidence stacks up. Um, the third thing I'd say is that um, if you look at the data closely, um, and it's not clear on a chart I had earlier, not clear enough, unfortunately, but before stage four lockdowns happened in Victoria, uh, even before stage three, when you looked at the mobility data, it had already started to dip down. <clears throat> in other words, households, in, even in the absence of restrictions imposed from above, households vote with their feet they, and they vote, i.e. not to move them. Mm. Um, and so if you end up with a situation where infection rates are, are, are high and you see infection rates soaring and you see death rates start to climb, Governments don't need to lock you down. You'll lock yourself down in a lot of cases. Yeah, um, so um, I think, um, so that's a really complicated way of answering it. Um, but I do also, but the, the other thing I'd note is if you want to minimize, um, if you want to protect people's welfare during all of this, um, if you wanted to minimize um, things like the, the impact on people's mental health, and the risk of, of heightened risk of suicide during this. Again, you needed governments to step up and provide large scale resources. And I, it goes back to my point earlier, I don't think governments did enough and they need to do more. Yeah, they did a lot, but they did need to spend more money um, mm. uh, in order to get people through this. Uh, look, it's, I think the fact that, that we, ha we do now have infection rates coming under control. And I think the fact that we, th there is a light at the end of the tunnel um, I think Frydenberg is being disingenuous because uh, he is desperately trying to get people to look elsewhere and away from aged care and away from the fact that he's cutting back household assistance. Um, so frankly, um, I, I take uh, the treasurer's complaints with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, the, now I'm not saying that Victoria is blameless here. What happened in quarantine was an absolute debacle and a disgrace mm. um, without any doubt whatsoever. Um, and I think, um, Victorian ministers and indeed the Premier have to share some of the blame for that. But what happened with that, that was just appalling. But also, um, they, they're not alone. What happened with Ruby Princess was also utterly appalling. There was a great article in one of the, uh, I think in the in the nine newspapers over the weekend, might have been Peter Archer, basically said, everyone's sorry, but no one's responsible. 
And I think that sums it up. That you might say you're responsible, you might say you're sorry, but you've still got a bloody job. And I, yes. I, I do think that once we start to see recovery take hold, and I think we people are going to have to step up and say, I don't deserve to, deserve to keep my job, and I'm going to have to do the honourable thing and resign. Well, uh, there is some some questions around recovery. I know you desperately weren't trying to get into politics there, and I think I avoided it. I think you might have just, and I, I did both sides. Yeah, you, you might have just gone to the line there, Brian. Um, there's a two. There's a couple of questions around uh, a dead cat bounce, and uh, the question posed to you, Brian, specifically, is that um, the recovery sort of, albeit you you've noted that it's uneven, drawn out, it's off a very very low base um, since March 2020. Um, because of the the um, the economy is essentially uh, heavily impacted by JobKeeper um, um, JobKeeper 2.0 and JobSeeker Home Builder. Is, is this a is it a false dawn? I think is the sense that I'm getting from members here. Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, the, to me, the false dawn comes about that if you turn off the tap too soon. Yes. If you turn off the tap when basically there's not enough underlying activity to support jobs, then in the absence of that support, the jobs go, mm. and the economy does. You you, you get a you get a, a a double dip or a, you get a W or whatever analogy you want to call it. Yeah. Um, to me, it highlights the fact that the economy will need ongoing support. So, as you start to th see things opening up and people get gradually rehired and industries start to come back. Yes, you taper off the support, that's fine, but you need to be prepared to change course if the recovery ends up being weaker than you otherwise thought. Because to me, um, the risk of a policy error here is large. Yeah. The United States is a, is, a, is a warning of what could happen. Um, the fact that they've turned off the tap um, on, house, mm -hmm. on significant household spending uh, at the end of July means the September and December quarters could be a lot weaker in terms of household spending and employment than they otherwise should be. Um, so, I th and I think Frydenberg and Co have been very sensible thus far in saying, right, we need to acknowledge the reality uh, that the economy is still weak and then Victoria happened. So yes. we're not gonna just turn off the tap. We're just gonna gradually taper this off. They need to be prepared to stall that and push the time horizon out a little, little bit further if necessary. But I absolutely agree with the question that there is a significant risk uh, that the recovery stalls and that we get further setbacks, whether it's yeah. because of a policy error or problems with infection control or whatever. Exactly. There's a there's a question around gold markets here, and I think we see that um, nightly, um, the gold, uh, the gold price uh, and where where it's gone. Could you do you have a a view on that? Um, um, the question here is it's 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 making uh, it's making significant returns. Is, is that a market that uh, has longevity? Um, short answer to, to, to that is no. Um, mm. Firstly, um, with gold, um, the most sensible way um, that I can come up with to, to think about gold is using opportunity cost. Yep. Uh, in other words, um, I'm owning gold, which pays me nothing uh, and costs me to store because um, if I didn't do that, I'd be owning, say, government bonds, especially inflation-protected government bonds. So there's a very nice long-term correlation between the gold price and the real yield on uh, inflation-linked government bonds in, in the US, in, in, for example. The fact that those yields are so low, the opportunity cost is negative. In other words, I'm, I'm not giving up anything by earning gold because my interest-bearing securities are paying me nothing. Okay. So as long as interest rates stay where they are or stay at these really, really low levels, in particular, as long as real inflation-linked bond rates stay at very low levels, um, then gold um, can, remains well-supported. But I'd mm -hmm. caution because, yes, that explains how we've got to where we are, but it doesn't mean the gold goes to two and a half to three to three and a half to 4,000 an ounce. Um, to me, if you saw those sort of levels, that is speculative bubble territory. Um, we often get the question um, come through the call centre, the contact centre, uh, why, why doesn't SunSuper own gold? And the answer is, and the, and the question is asked only because mm. it had done well in the past, um, but fundamentally it's a speculative asset. Um, there are some investors out there whose views I respect, who include it as part of a small 
small, poor part of their portfolio. Um, but frankly, um, uh, I just don't think um, we should be loaded up with highly speculative assets um, at this point, especially ones that have done that have done well in the past. Right. Um, because I just don't think there's longevity there. And, and frankly, I can't fundamentally value it. You, you show me a rental property or show me a BHP share or I, I can have a stab. I can have a stab at valuing it and tell you mm. what I think it's worth. And yeah, I, I'll probably be wrong, but at least I can make a fundamental assessment of it. But with gold, it is worth what anyone is prepared to pay on the day. Uh, and for, to me, that says speculation, not investing. Great, thank you. Um, this is probably in the shape of, um, uh, I guess, what you were you, when you were speaking about the sort of rise of big tech. But um, the question specifically is, what's your view on bio, on the biotech biotech space and biotechnology moving forward? Hmm. Um, I think that's slightly related. Yeah, I think it is. Let me let me deal with biotech because uh, if the question is specifically biotech, but I can address tech more generally, right? Um, let me, let me, um, biotech to me is really interesting because, um, again, how do I value it? Does it belong as a core part of a portfolio? Um, and I think the answer is no. Uh, and the reason I say that goes back to a similar discussion to the point about gold, where something doesn't have any earnings uh, and doesn't have any sort of profitable track record, yeah. I'm having a punt. Um, now, as an individual investor, or as even as a, a listed share manager, unless I have serious expertise in the health sciences, um, which would enable me to make genuine assessments about mm. the success or failure of particular companies, then I'm not investing, I'm speculating. Yeah. Um, now, um, th now, this means that to me, it does not belong as a big part of a, of a, of a core share portfolio. Um, but to me, it's, it's more traditionally sits in the venture capital space. Now, do you want to play in that space? Well, the people who do um, allocate a very small amount of money to dozens or hundreds of biotech plays around the place. Yes. So that um, for every CSL, there's another hundred duds. But yeah. you make so much on CSL that you end up delivering a very healthy return. But um, that's no guarantee. You, you know, you are paying, um, you're paying for Blue Sky. Um, you, you're paying for the expertise of the venture capital manager to identify these particular opportunities. I just not, I'm not sure it's a reliable source of return. I mean, we would all love, mm. wouldn't we? We would all love to pay 20 cents a share for the next CSL. Right, we? you know, but mm. it, the odds of that happening are not there. Um, we're not investing; we're speculating. Um, I thought that was. A, I'm, I'm channeling Anton Taliaferro there because he said a similar story at a presentation I was at some years ago. Um, yeah. He's quite a wise man, Anton, just quietly. Um, uh, but um, but yeah, so I, I I'd be a bit cautious there. Now, technology generally, though, we are not in 1999. Okay, because the world has moved. You think about the tech bubble in 1999, 2000, yep. the dot com bubble. These were companies that had no revenue. Um, most of them failed, right? No um, products, so no this services. was a bubble. Exactly. Um, yeah. Some of them were frankly taking the piss. Mm. Now the world has moved on. These are real businesses with real clients. In fact, um, one of the managers we, we used, made a point the other day is that look, let's not even think about them as tech companies, right? Mm. Um, Google is a media and advertising company. Um, Amazon mm. is a retailer. Um, yeah, they, they make use of technology, but they're, they're fundamentally real businesses generating real income. Mm. Yeah. Now, they were doing really, really well before COVID. What COVID has done is accelerated that trend. Um, it's, COVID has accelerated lots of pre-existing trends. Zoom is a classic case. Um, Zoom has also shot the lights out in the last little while for obvious reasons. Here we are. But Zoom was already on an uptrend yeah. um, and was already winning market share from WebEx and others um, pre-COVID. So a lot of trends in the technology space, a lot of businesses that were fundamentally profitable to begin with have had another big leg up as a result of COVID. But at least that, but they are real businesses. You're investing in them. You're not speculating in them is what I would say. Thank you. Got a, a, a question here from a, a member saying, how do you explain in clear terms credit spread 
when you're discussing it with clients? So a, a very simple uh, oh, explanation good question. of yeah, that. Yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah, um, think, I just think about it as, as, as risk. Um, I, could, I, I could lend money to a government or I could lend money to a company, okay? Um, if I lend money to a government, the odds of them not paying me back are minimal. Um, I could lend money to a company, the odds of them not paying me back are actually somewhat higher. They, companies go broke, governments rarely go broke, but companies do go broke. Yeah. I, if I'm gonna lend money to a company, I wanna be compensated for the extra risk I'm taking, and that's the spread. It's the extra yield, it's the extra interest rate that I need in order to take that extra risk. Thank you, Brian. I think that's clear, super clear. Um, got a question. Uh, I mean, this is a bit speculative, but just your view on the longevity of um, afterpay um, and, um, and where its share price is heading. I don't want you to make a comment on where its share price is heading, but afterpay certainly is a really interesting solution. I know um, loads of people are using it um, today, your, your view? Yeah, look, I don't have a strong view. And again, not being a, not being a stock picker. Yes, it's done brilliantly. Don't get me wrong. And, and it's clearly um, doing a lot of things right. Um, so I don't have a strong view on the company. Um, in fact, I don't really have any view on the company or its share price. But again, it is an example of pre-existing trends given another boost in COVID. Afterpay didn't come from nowhere. You know, yeah. um, this was already on an upswing and COVID has given it an, uh, an additional boost. Um, how much of that boost proves to be sustainable, uh, and this doesn't apply just to what I have to pay, but it applies to a whole range of tech players. Yeah. If we revert back to something vaguely normal, um, do, we, do we see a, a decrease in demand for a whole range of these services? Zoom being a classic case. Um, mm. that's really the, that's, that is really the $64 trillion question for which I don't really have an answer. Um, yeah. So I can't comment beyond that, really. You suspect the genie is out of the bottle on th th things like Zoom, though, don't you, right? I mean, the, the use of Zoom, you can't imagine, uh, well, I think it's difficult to imagine going back to something different because of the effectiveness and efficiency of this particular medium. I think that's very, very true. And, and it does have serious implications for long-term business travel and things like that. Mm. Um, but again, I mean, call me old fashioned, but I like face to face. I actually, and one thing I learned in my, you know, I've been back in the office a lot um, as soon as I was allowed to, because mm. um, I actually worked out, I quite like my colleagues. Um, I actually miss, <laughs> miss people. Um, I miss human interaction. I miss the culture. I miss the team dynamic. And as good as Zoom is, um, look, as yeah. good as Zoom is, I'm sorry, there's one invention that the sooner it gets killed off, the better is the phenomenon of Zoom drinks. Oh, is there a sadder way to spend your Friday afternoon than sitting by yourself in front of a bloody computer with a glass of shardy? Um, I'm sorry, what a pathetic existence that is. Really? Um, that, um, yes, so I think, yes, Zoom does have longevity quite clearly. Yeah. Um, and yeah. there will be better things than Zoom, right? There's clearly a lot of innovation that's gonna to continue to happen in this space. Yeah. Um, but I don't, this is here to stay to a large extent, but um, do I want to live my life in a shoebox um, doing webinars? Um, no disrespect to uh, my audience, but um, this is not a happy place to be. I would much rather actually be in front of an audience and actually having a conversation yeah. with people, um, even shaking hands. That would be really nice. I'd, oh my goodness. Um, sure. uh, so I, I totally agree right with you the about fast that. Lane. I, I totally agree with you about Zoom drinks. Can we just, uh, fi final question, if we could, um, the Apple mobility trends, the data that you put up. Um, so it came across incredibly, I think I know the answer to this, but yeah. like a tooth shape. So it was, it was all over the place. Is that just because of the data points that you're reading or is it? It's daily. And so it assumes yeah. that um, uh, you're not gonna get as much mobility on a Sunday. Um, so it picks up during the week and it comes down on the weekend. Um, so it's literally daily data. And so you get um, uh, quite a lot of daily variation. So it's not, it's too high frequency to do anything like seasonally adjusting or smoothing. Uh, God knows I've tried to actually present it better, but I've found that it's just yeah. better to let the raw data, show the raw data and have a look with your eyes and just follow the trend. That's, that's the best you can do. But 
it, it, I, but it is just very raw data and it's only got a relatively short history. The other thing I'd caution is we don't, because it's rel got a relatively short published history, um, we don't know um, exactly how it behaves over the course of an economic cycle. So I can't, for example, look at a, a movement in the chart and say, oh, because this mobility figure has fallen by say 10%, that means that's consistent with jobs falling by a percent or GDP or knocking X percent off GDP or anything like that. So we yeah. don't really have an, uh, we, we can't do that sort of detailed analysis about how they tend to, how it tracks the cycle, but it is, but it's very, very timely and very detailed, right? literally down to the, the country, region, sub-region and city level in a lot of places. It's, it is frightening how much Apple actually know about us. And, and does the, does you have the Android data as well, or, or yeah, it's... and Google do publish their data as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's all available for free. Um, you just yeah. Yeah, you just Google it, um, and uh, it'll it down it'll download you a day, daily Excel file with all the data. Um, so Fantastic. it's it's a really amazing resource and quite frightening. Brian, um, thank you uh, again. Uh, I know it's the second time you've come back around, and I know that you were you were looking at this and saying, "Well, is there is there different things you're going to present?" I think what um, what I've certainly taken out of this presentation, I know by the questions that we've got, I mean it's it's a very interesting um, recovery that we're that we're looking at off a very low base, as you said. I think it's going to be as you as you said, it's e it's uneven. It's going to be drawn out. I think that mobility trends data, whilst you can't absolutely uh, correlate it at the moment, what a fascinating piece of data. Um, gr growth versus value. I mean, you're pretty definitive there. Growth has outperformed value. And I think rise of the big tech, um, that's quite amazing that five, was it five or six, six stocks hold 20% yeah. um, and globally 14%. So it's a... Um, it's it's a fascinating um, area looking at um, big tech uh, and to that point around technology um, in general. Thank you for putting this together. Thank you for, frankly, having uh, an opinion. I mean, I'm not going to walk away with the opinion being hot desking is an abomination um, as the major opinion, but I tend to agree with you. I do like my own desk. Um, but I certainly appreciate you and the team at Sun Super being so... Uh, willingly uh, giving your time, but also putting together um, such an insightful presentation. As I said to the people who are online, Brian, uh, they're able to get in contact, uh, they're able to access this presentation off the AFA site, or alternatively reach out to the good folk at uh, Sun Super, who I'm absolutely sure will uh, put you in contact with the right people. Brian, thank you. Thank you to the um, uh, people who are the listeners and viewers out there. Thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate your time. As I said, the CPD will be coming out in the next week. I wish you all a very uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks very much, Robert. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you.